happy to be here and talk to you a little bit about our group and what we're doing and what we're hoping to do as we go forward in the future. Um, I used a title slide from another talk I gave and I revised the talk a little bit, so I'm going to talk a little bit more than about what we're doing with uh, informing medical providers. Um, but I want to kind of give you a little background as I've been in uh, as a private practice for most of my career, 10 years as a general internist, and then about 13, 14, 15 years trying to have a clinic only for looking at patients with this kind of chronic illness with the idea of uh, seeing what I could do to improve their management. And as that practice grew, uh, decided to really try to um, uh, lend this, my clinical uh, experience and also my patients to see if we could help research progress. Um, I think we know that, well, I was on the CFS advisory committee and I've served in a number of, of roles. And by far, the, the, the glaring gaps in this illness can be dumped into two pots, research and access to medical care. And of course, they're related. So um, a, a few, there's, uh, I won't spend too long time on this, but um, I just put together a few slides about you know, how did this happen? How did we get to this point where we have these patients who are very sick and they've been completely marginalized? And I'm speaking from the clinical standpoint. Um, and of course, it's lack of objective biomarkers, but honestly, uh, and the tests that we, the flip side of that is the tests that we have uh, don't really show very much, and yet we're kind of stuck in the clinical side using only those tests because of the many pressures that have come upon us, the high cost of medical care, the pressure to be efficient, less expensive, uniform, and still deliver quality in medicine, which means doctors are being forced more and more not to function outside the existing evidence base, which is a circular problem. And def definitely the case definitions have been confusing and largely inaccessible to clinicians uh, throughout all this time. And this golden uh, diagnostic test of communicating with the patient is very time consuming and very difficult for people at the primary care level to do. Low priority to this illness because it didn't kill people. And uh, this is a big one that the illness impact is not obvious to clinicians the way they're taught to take a history and do a physical exam. And then you add being rushed to that, and they can completely miss the, the physical exam and history findings that relate to this illness, and we need to teach them. But you know, pain, fatigue, cognitive impairments, exercise intolerance, orthostatic symptoms, we just don't train people to ask those questions or encourage it. And this is, you know, medicine is so specialized and Nobody wants these diseases and they don't fit in a specialty. And honestly, they are a multi-system. This is a multi-system illness. So it's almost too much for any specialist. And it's way too much for a lot of primary care doctors. And last is, um, and we've had trouble you know, meeting the standards of evidence-based medicine, which is why we don't have treatment guidelines. And uh, that's true in the field of fibromyalgia too, after all this time there really aren't any very good treatment guidelines for fibromyalgia, which is a decade ahead. To make it worse, this is, uh, this is an illness that's probably lurking in the areas where we have, uh, or clinicians have the least experiment, at least experience and the least tools. So, you know, we don't test for viruses very often and we lose that data. We really don't understand much about the immune and inflammatory systems, don't have the tools, and especially the neuroendocrine system, even endocrinologists. Uh, fall short in being able to evaluate the neuroendocrine system very well. And of course, it, the complexities of the autonomic nervous system. I've spent a lot of time on the phone at a major institution in our city talking to the cardiology and the neurology people that come the closest, understanding the function of the autonomic nervous system, and nobody wants it anyway, and they're very ill prepared to do that. And you know, then you just throw in environmental exposures and the fact that it's pretty difficult to measure these cellular energy defects. And uh, that's, that's been the major problem. And the other one is we lack a central, a central direction in medicine. And that might be good, right? That's, but, but just look at all the kinds of organizations that try to set guidelines or try to establish norms or try to use the evidence base to determine how things should be done. And they honestly don't influence each other very much, except indirectly. So this is just me as a lowly primary care physician trying to understand 
over the many decades uh, why things aren't moving more quickly. So obviously, we have a lot to do. And um, I had worked with a, a very small nonprofit organization that was run with all volunteers called Offer. Maybe some of you knew. And we decided that we were going to change our strategy and that if we wanted to try to fill those gaps, the research gaps and the provider access gaps, then we had to take our best skills and implement them. So uh, we, uh, I gave my practice to the nonprofit. We rebranded it. And now I work for the nonprofit. And this allows us to bring in more resources from other forms than I would be able to do in private practice. Like I can't submit a grant, for example, as a private uh, physician. So um, we, have, uh, we have a medical clinic. Uh, we have three providers, a nurse practitioner, a PA, and myself, two medical assistants, an RN. And we're working on how to make that more efficient, how to keep seeing patients. But I've been in practice a long time, and we're full. So uh, I've been trying for three years to get a qualified physician to come join my practice, and we're having the same problems everyone else's. We have developed a pretty good, uh, very experienced clinical research center and biorepository. Our clinic providers here oversee this, but we have two and a half full-time research coordinators. And Suzanne Vernon has been on a part-time as a li liaison, but now is with this grant uh, coming in to be uh, on a full-time basis. And then we've built in this support staff that was never possible when I ran a, a clinic on a shoestring and very limited staff. So that has been good, and we're just adding them one by one. But our goals as a nonprofit are to build and maintain an army of well-defined research participants and to use that to collaborate with promising research and scientists, rather than being the primary place where the research gets done, although we do some. We are committed to developing and providing resources for people with this illness, and that goes across a long spectrum. And we are committed to raising awareness among providers and seeing if we can impact that. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done. And remember, this started as a clinic, and then we added in uh, the ability to do research. But particularly when Suzanne came to join us, and I had someone to help me with all the collaboration and, and trying to find them. So if this is, our, this is our research department right here. And actually, we've always subsisted on pharma trials, because pharma trials are very supportive. And we've always done fibromyalgia, uh, trials just for treatment of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, but that has been um, our kind of our ability to stay in the game for a long time. And we still have a number of those going. But our biomarker discovery project is basically building that biorepository and patient base of well-defined MECFS patients. And we've been able to collaborate with um, researchers at the University of Nat Nevada with Patrick McGowan on his epigenetic studies, at, at Kathy and Alan Light. Uh, Daria on an earlier study, um, the CDC multi-site study, and we have uh, in the last six months sent uh, almost all of our samples to the Stanford uh, Genome Center, and um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Lipkin on many of his projects as we've gone forward. And there's some value to this, and there's a problem with this, right? What we have, though, is a relatively small cohort of patients that have been looked at in a number of ways, which is good. Um, but the biggest thing is we haven't been able to, you know, really expand the number of patients in the clinic because I'm so short-handed, which stops the flow of patients into the research repository. So in this more recent grant uh, with Daria, we proposed that we would try to enroll 200 patients whose onset had been three years or less from the time of enrollment. And any of you in the clinic setting know that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> so I'll tell you <coughs> some of the things I'd like to, that we think we can do to accomplish this. But I certainly uh, would welcome the help of anybody who has leads. These people will have to come to our site, and they will have to be evaluated in clinic before they're enrolled in the study to ensure that we are enrolling the correct people in the study. And then it will be great uh, to be working as a clinical site with the grant at Columbia as well. We're looking forward to that. But I just think it's, it's pretty amazing to see what we've been able to do as a, with very low resources simply by um, leveraging this gold uh, 
uh, this pile of gold and our poor patients walk in every day <laughs> with, for a new study and they've been so good at participating in studies but it is exhausting for them. So our clinic is freestanding but it's situated between the University of Utah and between Intermountain Healthcare. And if any of you are familiar with this big system, it was the one that Obama talked about in his inauguration speech as one of the more forward thinking uh, medical, um, oh, they own hospitals and healthcare, health plans and everything that isn't owned by someone else, but about a half at least. But what's really cool is in between these two and connecting these two institutions are, the, are the, is the Center for Clinical and Translational Research at the University of Utah funded by the CTSA uh, NIH money and they work with clinicians across both institutions. So they have already a network of clinicians that want to refer into research and we have a commitment from the director of this to help us identify cl uh, clinicians that we can train to make a diagnosis of ME-CFS. And that is taking us over a very big barrier. And basically said, I'm just gonna tell them, forget everything you knew and start over now <laughs> when they come to the classes. And he's an amazing guy, his name's Will Deer. Um, it, surprisingly enough, he was my favorite fa uh, junior faculty member when I was a resident. And then he moved on, he went into pharma, in, into pharma and into academics and has circled back doing clinical and translational research which is pretty cool. We also have the Utah Population Database, uh, which is a rich repository of uh, information. And it also, well, it's everybody in Utah, but it also encompasses the entire uh, base of these two institutions. So our plan is to uh, see what we can do to infiltrate these two institutions with uh, continuing medical education and also inform them about our study and see if we can cast a very wide net to pick up uh, patients early in disease. So I wanted to talk to you also about a little bit about our, our other programs because I think everything is a little bit designed to come at physician education, patient empowerment, and research in one way or another. So if you look at, this is our clinic right here, the medical clinic, and if you look at the request to be a clinic patient, and almost every center knows this, and I made this number up, I would say we see less than 10%, and it's worse than that, who actually get into clinic. So the majority of those patients didn't have access to anything, and uh, you know they would sometimes travel, but most of them never get access. So when we hired our new staff, we decided we were going to implement a no-wait program so that everyone who walked through our door could be given some kind of information or resource, even if we couldn't see them in the clinic. And indirectly, by influencing these patients, we'll be, in, we'll be trying to influence their primary care clinicians. So we just finished our first pilot of a lecture series that I do. Uh, people have to register and come and sit like a student. And um, we keep the numbers pretty low. It's a, like a one hour lecture on these various topics. And it's been amazing. We sent the letter out to 800 people on our waiting list and said we'd register the first 20 people who called. And the first five responses came back in like 30 minutes. Uh, so the demand it, it, the, and the response has been incredible. Because honestly, what do we do in our clinics? It's a lot education and informing people and helping them learn to adapt with their illness. So we're gonna keep that going. For now, I'll teach those lectures. Then I have a nurse practitioner who's developed a lecture of how to communicate with your primary care physician. <laughs> that those, they're supposed to sign up with that before they come to my lectures so then they can take all the information that they learn and uh, take it back to their uh, primary care. And then we're setting up um, professionally led support groups and behavioral management groups. And we're a little stalled on this because our key person had medical issues and he has MECFS and he's been down and out. So we've been a little slowed on that. And then we hope to add other things, exercise and physical therapy and manual methods and all those things. So, but this is the really interesting one I wanna tell you about is my nurse practitioner um, is taking all of our uh, intake materials that we've used over the years and developed with standardized questionnaires and symptom surveys and review systems. And she's, they're planning to let people 
in a non-clinical setting meet with trained volunteers or the nurse practitioner and compile their own medical history review systems and take this, the answers on their standardized questionnaires and everything back to their primary care. So we've designed something where the team will, and we're gonna train pre-med students and we're already working on this because they love the chance to talk to patients and they don't have to do any assessment, they don't have to do any physical exam, but they compile all the records, the labs, and create, we're, we're doing a, a front sheet summary document and then all the documents creating a packet and we'll send it back to their primary care doctor. So in the meantime, we've trained these future clinicians. Um, we've, and I think we may, we're developing a packet also of information about MECFS to take back to these clinicians. And it just dawned on me, if, if everything goes well and the patient wants to do this, we'll send the pre-med student with them to their doctor's visit, to the clinician's visit, to help advocate on their behalf and, and help be their voice. So that's our kind of fun project that we're getting ready to launch that we haven't started yet. So, and all of these things, you know, help us uh, figure out patients that are appropriate to uh, enroll in the research. So our strategies essentially are to try to, uh, you know, leverage this triangle of our assets with the primary care ranks and with people who have illness and see if we can uh, move this along a little bit. Um, we've just taken a policy that we are going to, especially among the providers, we're gonna emphasize the findings of the Institute of Medicine report, how to make a diagnosis, and also um, how, to, how to understand fibromyalgia diagnostic criteria because there's a lot of confusion in the field regarding these issues. And as uh, in our own setting, we're trying to operationalize in our research, see if we can operationalize some of these major uh, core symptoms of the IOM report, which is why we're doing this Nasaline test, seeing if study to see if we can give clinicians a bedside test that they can do uh, on their own patients in the office. Um, we have already, oh, now my phone wants me to sign in. How are we doing? Five minutes. Okay. So our, we have a goal of developing CME lectures, and we have actually scheduled our first four-hour CME event at our clinic, and our intent is to combine with Will Deere, his network of uh, physicians at the Clinical and Translational Research Center and see what we can do to invite those targeted clinicians to come to the first pilot CME so that we'll have um, a chance to really work with them and go through the major presenting aspects of illness. We also uh, hope to develop shorter lectures and invite ourselves as much as possible, which we've done for a long time. Uh, but the demand is getting higher because the interest level is changing. Um, so, and then we really uh, are looking for ways to identify these patients with early onset. We're hoping to build out a website section that's sort of a one-stop shopping for medical providers uh, so they can see some of the major resources, uh, links to some of the major resources. Um, we're just in the early stages of being able to do that. And I just wanted to make the point that we can't just tell people how to diagnose the illness. We need to provide information on how to, how to do a differential diagnosis. I mean, what have we learned as clinicians of the field about picking up these patients who have some kind of an environmental exposure or you know, some other hidden illness? And you know, what do people look for when you've done stage one, stage two tier of diagnostic workup? You can't just stop. Uh, but that's where it becomes difficult to get people to the right, right clinician. I also think we need to teach clinicians how to do a good physical exam and look for the things that we know you can find in our patients. And that, you know, they're really, they're, although there aren't any specific diagnosis, the diagnostic tests just for the illness, we actually have a lot of things we can look for uh, that are evidence of small fiber neuropathy, we really need, I, I feel strongly that we need to build something up front to help clinicians screen uh, to understand what, what makes the patient sick in the first place. I don't think three months should pass before uh, a, a much broader diagnostic battery of tests should be done to look for pathogens. Um, we can do sleep evaluations, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, neurologic studies. So the last thing I wanna say is our our next goal, and uh, this, I was at the, uh, the gathering of scientists at Stanford and Ron, at Ron Davis's uh, 
conference, it was really great to be behind closed doors with all the researchers who shared their data and talked about collaboration and also gave each other pointers about what's to, what to do next. But when the meeting was over, I was the, sing I was the only clinician there, because, and this was because of my collaboration with the, uh, the Stanford Genome Center with all the samples. You know, basically, they all turned to me and said, okay, now it's your responsibility to you know, pick the brains of clinicians who've been in the field all these years and help us know what we need to look for. So we're planning uh, a small uh, event in um, hopefully the end of February, or early March, where we're gonna try to bring together um, clinicians who pretty much just do this, have done it for years, and you know, have done lots of treatment trials and are keeping up with what's going on across the field and see if we can get some consensus about what the most promising research targets ought to be and also provide some sensible guidelines for clinicians down the road, even if we don't call them guidelines. <laughs> All right, I think that's probably it for me. So I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bateman.